we doing? We doing all right? It's a little chilly. Are you chilly? I'm a little cold, so you got to grab your hands together. Get yourself warm. Well, uh, welcome this morning into uh, the coolest church in Fairborn. How about that? See what I did there? See, cool. And welcome those who are watching us online. Again, we encourage you to tweet along with us uh, using the hashtag MadTheology15. Well, we are in week three of this series, and uh, we've been kind of taking the things that uh, culture believes and the world believes and kind of matching them up with uh, how the church uh, views things and what the church does. And we're seeing some kind of inconsistency. That's why we're calling this Mad Theology. And uh, the thing that we're going to talk about today is one of the theories that surrounds heaven. So having that, you know, fluffy place above the white clouds, you know, rock on, party on, Garth type stuff goes on there, right? So have you ever wondered or thought about how do I get to heaven? Have you ever thought about that? Wondered about it? I mean, it's a good question, isn't it? I mean, most of us uh, would probably say there's one kind of common denominator for how we get to heaven. Anybody know what it is? Close. But we all have to have this happen in order to get to heaven, we got to be dead. <laughs> oh, there's that. Just a tiny piece. We all have to be dead, right? You got to be dead to get to heaven. But, but other than the whole death part, which is kind of a big one for us, I mean, is there a secret handshake or a password that we have to have to get through those pearly gates? I mean, there's got to be something that we do down here that can influence or impact what happens on the other side of the grave. And one of the most widely spread theories in our culture is this notion that the way in which we get to heaven is to be a good person. Because heaven is good, right? And so it would make sense that in order to go to a good place, you had to be a good person. I mean, that makes sense, right? And so uh, we, we are encouraged to be good in this world, to live good lives, to get along and just be happy, right? Daydream believers, we're happy. In fact, I just saw an insurance commercial this week, and everybody was doing good things. And it was this ripple effect where one person saw somebody doing good, and so later on that day, they did some good, and so on and so forth. You see, we like good, because good feels what? Good, right? I mean, our kids are told to be good and nice, otherwise Santa brings you what? Coal in your stocking. It's a bad way to start Christmas. I mean, our kids are told play by the rules. In fact, we don't let any losers uh, happen in games anymore. Everybody wins, so we don't keep score. We're told to do this good thing, and your reward will be this. So we do good a lot. But how good do we have to be to be good enough? I mean, I wish I could say that this is just a cultural and societal thing, but we, we see that in the church over the years we have fallen into this myth and we have jumped on this just be nice and good person bus. In fact, many well-intentioned churches have kind of screwed up our theology a little bit on heaven because they have taught the idea that the requirement to follow Jesus and to get into heaven were to be nice and good. And they may not have said this explicitly. They may not have stood up on Sunday morning and said, in order to get to heaven, you have to be a good person. But it was how they did things, and so it was an implicit way. So like this, I'm a little uh, hot up here, physically, and I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the church can be seen over the years uh, by, by implicitly showing this good uh, way of living uh, through something called flannel graph Jesus. Anybody remember flannel graph Jesus? If you don't remember flannel graph Jesus, they had this huge uh, felt board. And you had little felt characters. And you would stick the little felt characters on the board and you had to smooth them out. Do you remember this? You had to smooth out the little felt characters so that they wouldn't get all like bunchy and clumpy and fall off. Because it's really bad when you're talking about flannel graph Jesus and he falls off. Not a good situation. Now, I do need to kind of um, give this disclaimer because uh, I'm not saying the actual process and method of using the flannel board uh, was bad. Nor am I saying that it was an ineffective way of teaching. It was a great teaching tool. And I'm not saying that all churches and Sunday schools that did this and Sunday school teachers that used this method taught the wrong thing because that's not what I'm saying. I learned many a Sunday from the flannel graph. I think I turned out okay. But for too many churches, the flannel graph Jesus embodied a culture that taught 
Life is just good. It's filled with bright colors, smiling animals going on a boat ride, while the rest of them are going to be killed. It's about Jesus being surrounded by white, fluffy sheep, everyone looking happy. And rarely were the stories that were more difficult ever told on the flannel graph. The flannel graph Jesus, in all reality, lacked a lot of depth, physically and spiritually. Another instance of this be good and nice message came in the late 90s when uh, what has been called the seeker-friendly movement uh, church happened. Or as I like to call it, the Snuggie-wearing feel-good church. <laughs> this is the church Snuggie. I don't think this is real, but it's highly entertaining. And so the Snuggie wearing Feel Good Church, or the Seeker Friendly Movement Church, uh, sought to basically strip everything that had to do with church and Jesus out of the process. These types of churches rarely talked about sin, they rarely talked about repentance, they never mentioned hell, or very rarely did, nor did they tell you what it was to live a holy life. In fact, most of these Snuggie wearing Feel Good Churches preached a message that just left you happy at the end of the day because they wanted you to feel good. Now, don't get me wrong, because I don't want you to hear this, walk away with we're not supposed to live good lives. It's important to be nice and to be a good person. I encourage uh, both my kids on a daily basis. It's important that you're nice. Just don't walk around punching people. It's not a good idea. You know, I want them to do good, and I want them to be good in this world. But our good people go to heaven theory has some holes, and there's a lot of issues with it. And the first is we do not truly know how good we have to be to be good enough. I mean, maybe you know. If you know, I would like you to come up here and we'll just finish. Do you know how good you have to be to be good enough? I mean, is there a good deed marker that we have to get to or so many deeds that we have to check off on a list during our life? I mean, is God like Santa and keeping track of all the nice and naughty things that we do? I mean, man, I did three bad things this week and only two good. I'm getting close to that naughty list, I think. I better do a few more uh, good things and check them off just in case. I mean, do we, do we really want to do good things in life or do we do good things because the image we have of heaven is way better than the one we have of hell? I mean, do you desire to be a good person because you have no desire to go to hell because that is not the place that you want to spend eternity? It's hot. Uh-uh. I'm good with the cooler weather, cooler than the other side of the pillow. So do we do good to just get into heaven or do we do good to stay out of hell? I mean, I'm 35. I think I've been pretty good in my life, but if going to heaven is based on me being good... What about those times when I'm not so good, not so perfect? Now, i got to preface that. It only happens once in every 10 years. Whew. But I have, been, have I been good enough to overcome those not-so-good moments in my life? Or am I more on God's naughty list at this point? And so not only are we unsure of how good enough we have to be, but we can't even agree on what is good in the first place. I mean, what happens when my idea of good is different than yours? I mean, what I think might be good and what you think may be good are maybe two different types of good. I mean, you might even think I'm bad and, well, that just wouldn't be any good. I mean, is good driving the speed limit? Is good stopping at stop signs? This is to my mother. Is good stopping at a stop sign in the middle of a grocery store parking lot at 1 a.m. when nobody's around? But you got to stop because it's a stop sign. <laughs> is good helping somebody else? Here's a good one. Is good leaving the mattress tag on? <laughs> is good giving the last cookie to your sad-faced little kid that says, P -p please, when you really, really, really wanted it? Well, maybe good is making your bed, cleaning your room, washing and putting away all the dishes and your clothes. <laughs> is good dusting your baseboards? Who does that? Well, maybe good is giving to charity, obeying all ten commandments all the time, volunteering, going to church, being kind, loving, patient, good, having good morals and ethical life. Are these things really good enough if we do them? 
I mean, does me really being nice and good get me into heaven? I mean, is that what it is? You see, if all I have to do is mind my P's and Q's, not rock the boat, play nice with my friends, and hope my good outweighs my not so good, if that's all it takes, then why are we here? If all I have to do is make sure that I do a little bit more good than I do bad in life, then why do we do this? And a better question yet is why the cross? Because if I could get into heaven based on what I do and what I do alone, then Jesus died for absolutely no reason. You see, the biggest issue with this good people go to heaven theory is that it completely contradicts everything that happened in the scriptures. I mean, and we don't have to look very far to see that uh, this theory is invalid. We just have to look at the beginning of the Bible. Because right off the bat in the, in the book of Genesis, we read that we're probably not so good people. So this is in Genesis 3. We're going to jump around a little bit today. Uh, so I'll have all the scriptures on the screen for you. But feel free to jump along with me. So Genesis 3, we're going to start verse 6 and 8. Uh, so what happened to Genesis? Well, what happened in Genesis was Eve got a little hungry. Now, I need to preface this because, uh, guys, I need you to listen. There's this myth that we don't like to eat because we want to have that nice, you know, Barbie figure that is false. Ladies, we like to eat. Amen? Amen. We like to eat a lot. Okay? So Eve got hungry. It shouldn't be a shock to any of us that Eve got hungry. And because Eve got hungry, she was tricked by a talking snake, because that happens every day. She was tricked by a talking snake who convinced her that God didn't want them to have any fun in Eden. And the snake told her that it will be just fine, Eve, if you eat from the only tree that God said was off limits. And so we read in verse 6, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. I like to think that she was so hungry, she just devoured all of it at one time. Hence the dun, dun, dun. That should happen every time we read it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So he's not so, uh, you know, squeaky clean in this either. And then the eyes of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid. They were ashamed. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So she ate the apple. She did that thing that she wasn't supposed to do. She entered into that not so good moment of life and she knew she messed up. And for the first time ever in our history, sin entered the world. And ever since that day, creation has been tainted with sin. No one is without sin. Okay, so I need, to, I need to break something to you. Are you ready? Might need to take a big deep breath. It's a good thing you're sitting down. No one is good. Nobody. And not only are we not good, but we're a bunch of sinners. Whew. Okay, I was worried about that one. I feel like the hush fell across the crowd. You see, none of us are good because you and I are sinners. And Paul says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of this sin is death. That is completely different than all good people go to heaven. Because if that's the case, we're a bunch of sinners. So how the heck can we get in? And so not only do we have this as our starting point in life, so we're not even good, we're a bunch of sinners, uh, we have Jesus, who in our mind is probably the best of all, right? Who we think should go to bat for the good people and all that good stuff. But even Jesus preaches the opposite theory. In fact, Jesus says, good people don't go to heaven. 
Nowhere in Scripture do we hear Jesus say, if you do these good things and you live your life as a good person, you will find yourself, are you ready for this? High five in St. Peter. This is my bad dancing moment. So you're going to high five St. Peter doing the whip and the nay-nay right on through those pearly gates. Maybe you do the bop. Bop. No, no. Nowhere did Jesus say you're going to do a high five and dance if you're a good person. In fact, he tells the Pharisees the opposite. Now, why does it matter that he tells the Pharisees? Well, here we go. Because the Pharisees were the good church people. They were the religious leaders of the time. And they were known as professional do-gooders. Goodness was what they did. It's who they were. If you wanted to see someone who was living a good life, all you had to do was watch the Pharisees. But check this out. We hear Jesus preaching to a crowd of people. And he says this in Matthew 5, 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, unless your way of living, unless your goodness can pass them the best of the best, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a minute. So the best of the best can't make it in by what they do. So who can? And then it gets worse. So not only does Jesus tell the good people they can't get in, but we have Jesus inviting the tax collector into his inner circle. A tax collector. I don't know about you, but I don't think of tax collectors as good people. And then he dines with an IRS agent. Again, not someone I'd want to have dinner with. And then to make matters worse, he starts mingling around with the prostitutes and the dirty people. Come on, Jesus. It's not who you're supposed to be hanging out with. And then one of the most shocking scenes in all of Scripture is this moment when Jesus is on the cross. And he looks next to him. And there's a criminal who had just said, you know what, my bad deeds far outweigh all my good ones. But Jesus, please Remember me when you you get into paradise. And Jesus says, absolutely. You are coming with me. I don't know about you, but to me, this doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, there's a reason we call this the Math Theology Series, because this is ridiculous. This This is insane. Good people don't make it in. The bad people do. It doesn't equate But this is only crazy talk if we continue to believe that simply being a good person is good enough. But it begins to make a little bit more sense and things get a little little clearer if we understand first that good people don't go to heaven because there are no good people. There are only sinners who are desperately in need of grace. Have you ever wondered or noticed that none of the authors of the scriptures gave us this checklist of good deeds to complete, a list that if we filled them out would guarantee us a spot in heaven. You see, the reason the Bible doesn't give us a checklist of good deeds to get done is because every single author understood that humanity is sinful and we don't need a checklist. We need a savior. We don't need a checklist. I don't need one more thing to do in a day, but I do need Jesus to save me. You see, when we, be- we believe the good people go to heaven theory, we cheapen the gospel so much that we actually present a message of grace that is void of the cross. But Paul said to the Galatians, he said, I do not set aside, I don't put aside the grace of God. For its righteousness could be gained through the law. If righteousness could be gained by what I do, then Christ died for absolutely nothing. If I can get to heaven, if my salvation can be achieved on my own, then Jesus absolutely wasted his time. You see, when we believe that good people get to heaven in life, we accept a cheap grace that comes void of the cross. You see, we are sinners, in fact, that are saved by this grace. A grace that is a free gift, unmerited, meaning we don't have to turn in our checklist of St. Peter at the door. We don't have to sing the right song. We don't have to give the right password, the proper fist bump like 10 times this way, this way, this way, this way. Because while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. 
this grace, the completely free gift that we have been given that saved us. It was free for us, but very, very costly to the one who gave it to us. I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, and I'm sorry, we're reading this in staff, one of his books, and I, it just struck me this past week. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's an incredible theologian and pastor, said that this grace was given to us at the highest of all prices, for this grace cost a man his life and cost God his one and only son. And hear this, he said, what has cost God everything? What cost God everything? It cannot be cheap for us. It cannot be easy for us. And it cannot be as simple as just being good and nice. You see, the cross changed the game. And the cross is what exposed the good people go to heaven theory as invalid. Jesus died for you. Do not let those actions be done in vain. So we're back to our question. How do we get in? How do you get into heaven? All we got to do is look at what Jesus said to Nicodemus. This is John 3.16. We say it a lot. It's at football games on big signs. So we should know what it takes to get into heaven, right? But I think sometimes we forget. Jesus said, For God so loved the world. He so loved us. He was so broken when we happened to uh, not do so good things in the garden. He is so in love with us that he gave his one and only son that only the, this side of the room can get in. No, 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 no. He gave his one and only son that whoever, this is huge, whoever, not a certain group of people. Not if you look this way, if you, if you fit the hipster style jean wearing skinny stuff. Which I do not. If you fit this mold, you get in. He didn't say that. Whoever. And that is good news because you and I are whoever. And it is exactly the same way. It is exactly the same method. Whoever believes in him. Not whoever has the best checklist of good deeds. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So I'll ask you again, how do you get into heaven? Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. No secret code, no fancy handshake, no good deed list to complete. Believe in Jesus. Jesus. Now, there is kind of a, this is, it's, a, it's a big terminology, right? I mean, that's a broad definition. Because believing in Jesus isn't that flannel board or snuggy wearing feel-good belief about him. But this is more of a drop everything and follow you immediately type of belief. It's a belief that has a hold of us in both the good and the bad times, 10,000 reasons times. It's a belief that allows us to say, regardless in life of what happens, we're going to praise you and bless your name. It's a belief that Jesus compels us to entrust our life to him and surrender our wants and our desires for his will. And when we begin to believe in Jesus, a few things start to happen. We acknowledge that we are sinners in desperate need of grace. And for some reason, to just say that, to accept that, to hear that, it kind of stings, doesn't it? I mean, I usually don't start out conversations with people saying, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. Good. Are, are you having a good day? Absolutely. Well, I, I need to tell you something. Okay, what is it? You're a sinner. I'll see you later. <laughs> That's not usually how I begin my conversations, nor is it how I begin my day with people. But when we believe in Jesus, we begin to recognize our sinful nature. And we use it as a reminder to us that we aren't perfect, that we aren't good, and we can't go through this life alone because we need someone to rescue us out of the mess we got ourselves in. Admitting I'm a sinner is an instant reminder that he is God and I am not. And it reminds us of the incredible grace that we have been saved by. And most importantly for me, 
Admitting I'm a sinner reminds me that God isn't finished with me yet. And he's still working on us. And then we, we begin to kind of see that we're a sinner, and so we start repenting of our sins. And this isn't a repent uh, asking for forgiveness on Saturday, going to church on Sunday, and then starting right back up Monday morning. It's not how it works. Repenting is also not uh, being in a bad situation, uh, saying, God, I promise to turn my life around if you get me out of this right now, because this is a really bad situation. And then when he does that, saying, hey, good job. See you later. You see, when we repent, we know that there are things that keep us separated from God and commit to not doing them anymore. We turn and go the other way. We turn to do a 180. We leave them behind. Addictions, lifestyle, poor decisions, hurtful actions, things that we say, things that we don't say, things that we do and not do. Now, do we repent once and we're good to go? Is that how it works? It'd be really easy if it did. Nope. Remember, we're human and we're what? Sinners. And our nature is to default to sin. So it's going to happen again. But, but when we believe in Jesus, we know that God is there to give us the strength to overcome whatever it is that's getting in the way. And finally, we begin to put our whole trust and faith in him as we seek to live fully devoted lives to Jesus which means that we trust that Jesus is who he says he is. And because of that, we trust with everything we have that his grace and his action on that cross saved us, forgave us, and freed us and made us people that live on the other side of the resurrection. And when we put our complete faith and trust in Jesus, we stop worrying about whether we did enough good deeds for the day. We stop worrying about that one bad thing we did whether or not my five good things can outweigh that one bad. You see, when we start believing in Jesus, he lifts that pressure off of us to feel like, I gotta do good so that I can get into heaven because I just want to stay out of hell. We stop believing our good deeds get us there. And we begin to do them. I need you to hear this because I don't want you to walk away saying so we don't have to be good. It's not what I'm saying. We stop believing our good deeds get us to heaven, and we do good things not to get out of hell, but because, here it is, they are an outpouring of our faith and our understanding of who Jesus is in our life. We do good things because they are who we are. Because if Jesus is in us, Jesus is as good as it gets. And if he is living inside of us, we begin to ooze goodness because of that. Not because we are really terrified of where we're going. Does that make sense? So you want to get into heaven? Anybody want to get into heaven? Like five of you, man, this is sad. <sighs> All right, so this is how this is going to work. Uh, the, the, the ones that said, no, you don't really want to get into heaven, you're, you're lying. Um, and so uh, you can start believing in Jesus. Uh, you can repent of that sin. So do you want to get into heaven? Yeah. Stop worrying about a checklist and start believing in the Savior who loved you so much that he was willing to die for you. You don't need a checklist. You need a Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to pray, uh, and here's how this is going to work. Um, because if you're like me, every once in a while you need to be reminded of this. You need to be reminded that I don't, I don't have to continue to worry about the good stuff because, because Jesus takes care of that for me. And so we're going to pray. And, and if this is the first time you have ever heard something like this, I encourage you. If you don't believe in Jesus, I encourage you to, to pray this prayer with me. If you do believe in Jesus, I, can, I encourage you to listen to it and be reminded that we still give our life to Jesus every single day. Sound good? Make sense? All right. Lord Jesus, we know that we have broken your laws. We know that our sins have separated us from you. We are truly sorry. And now we want to turn away from our past sinful life towards you. So we ask that you forgive us. We ask that you help us avoid making those same mistakes and sinning again. 
We believe that your son, Jesus, died for our sins, was resurrected from the dead, is alive, and he hears our prayers. So Jesus, I invite you into my life. I invite you to become my Lord and my Savior, to rule and reign in my heart from this day forward. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me and guide me so that I can obey you and do your will, not just this day, but for the rest of my life. We love you and we thank you. It is in your holy and good name. I'll go and leave this place knowing that you don't have to complete a checklist today. You just need to believe in Jesus, the one who died on a cross so that we could be in a better place than anywhere else without him. Go in his grace and his love and his incredible mercy that he sheds upon you. Have an awesome day, and we will see you next Sunday. Amen and amen.